I am Dr. Fred Southwick, Professor of Medicine and author of the book, Infectious Diseases, A Clinical Short Course. And today I want to talk about antibiotic therapy and how to apply approaches that will reduce the risk of selecting for antibiotic-resistant pathogens. In 1994, Newsweek's cover warned of the end of the antibiotic era. In their article, they described how Dr. Gilbert desperately tried one antibiotic after another on his 57-year-old kidney patient. But no matter which tablets, capsules, or IV antibiotics he gave the patient, from ampicillin to tycoplanin, the man's blood cultures remained positive for enterococcus. Dr. Gilbert, an infectious disease specialist, noted that we tried six or seven different medications, some alone, some in combination, some we didn't think would work, but we had nothing else to try. Sometimes his patient's blood cultures turned negative, but within days the infection came roaring back and his blood cultures again were positive. One morning, after trying to treat him for over two months, Dr. Gilbert gathered his courage and walked softly into the man's room. I guess you're coming to tell me I'm dying, the patient said. Nothing had worked, he explained. They had run out of options. Antibiotics, the miracle drugs of the 20th century, had been bested by bacteria, the most primitive organisms on earth. Several days later, the man died of endocarditis and sepsis. In our earlier lectures, you learned about the enormous adaptability of bacteria. Because they are able to share genetic material over time under the pressure of, of antibiotic coverage, resistance strains always overgrow. We have recognized that the overuse and misuse of antibiotics has led to the steady rise in antibiotic-resistant bacteria. What are some of the reasons for overuse of antibiotics? First, too often antibiotics are prescribed to fulfill the patient's expectations rather than to treat a true bacterial infection. They are given for viral upper respiratory infections, including viral pharyngitis and serosotitis media. Secondly, farmers have been using antibiotics for their livestock, contaminating our food with antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Third, physicians too often use a broad-spectrum antibiotic for all infections. A single antibiotic cannot fulfill all of infectious disease needs. Fourth, treatment regimens are often too long, therefore uh, increasing the likelihood of a resistant pathogen. Physicians ignore the remarkable adaptability of bacteria, fungi, and viruses at their patient's peril. And effective therapy is dynamic and requires a basic understanding of microbiology. The shotgun approach to infectious diseases must end, or we may truly experience the end of the antibiotic era. You've learned about the pharmacokinetics of the different classes of antibiotics in earlier lectures. Therefore, there is no need to go over this material again. But there is one important principle that I want to emphasize. There are two classes of antibacterial effects, and these differences impact how these two classes of antibiotics should be dosed. First, the beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenems, bind to penicillin binding proteins with high affinity. Because these proteins have a fixed KD, the concentration at which half of the antibiotics are bound and half is free is constant. Once the concentration exceeds 10 times that of the KD, the binding sites are saturated and higher dosing levels are of no benefit. This classical pharmacokinetic curve of an intravenous administration of an antibiotic is shown. For beta-lactam antibiotics, the peak of the dose does not matter. What is important is maintaining the serum levels above the MIC, which translates into concentrations above the penicillin binding protein PBB KD for over 50% of the time to maximize killing. 
For these antibiotics, frequent moderate doses or constant infusion are the ideal dosing strategy. For example, penicillin DG ideally should be given every two to four hours to maintain levels continuously above the MIC. Cephalosporin should also be dosed in this manner. For antibiotics that depend on maintaining high concentrations within the bacteria to maximize killing, concentration-dependent killing, the dosing strategies are very different. The most studied classes of concentration-dependent antibiotics are aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones. The ideal dosing strategy is to give maximal doses less frequently to maximize the peak serum level and the area under the curve. Even after the serum level drops below the MIC, these two classes of antibiotics continue to kill bacteria because of residual antibiotic retained in within the bacteria. This is called the post-antibiotic effect and continues for several hours. For aminoglycosides, once per day dosing is now recommended and fluoroquinolones are either dosed once per day, levofloxacin, or twice per day, ciprofloxacin. Another important consideration is toxicity. And the various toxicities of antibiotics have been covered in previous lectures. However, I want to emphasize two key points. First, the challenge of penicillin allergy. Penicillin is the most common drug allergy identified in medical records, with a prevalence ranging from 6 to 25%. However, the rate of positive skin tests is only 0.8%. Although a large number of patients are labeled as having a penicillin allergy, more than 95% of them can safely receive penicillin when they are carefully evaluated. Therefore, it is important to go over the history and in patients with atypical reactions such as nausea and vomiting, skin testing to remove the label of penicillin allergy is now recommended. The second point is that these studies now reveal that patients who cannot be given beta-lactam antibiotics because of a penicillin allergy label have a more prolonged hospitalizations. They are more likely to develop resistant pathogens they are also more likely to die. The cephalosporins are the safest class of antibiotics and are among the most effective. Whenever possible, cephalosporin should be the treatment of choice and clinicians need to make every effort to avoid inaccurately classifying patients as allergic to penicillins or cephalosporins. Now let's summarize the content of this video. First, I described Dr. Gilbert's case to illustrate in personal terms the consequences of infection with a highly antibiotic-resistant pathogen. Next, we reviewed the practices that have led to the development of antibiotic-resistant pathogens. First, the unnecessary prescribing of antibiotics for viral infections. Second, the overuse of antibiotics by the farming industry. Third, the strategy of using one broad-spectrum antibiotic for all infections, and finally, the tendency of clinicians to administer antibiotics for excessively prolonged periods. Next, we reviewed the differences in dosing for beta-lactam antibiotics that bind to a specific penicillin binding protein, and aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones, concentration-dependent antibiotics. And finally, we discussed the harm caused by overdiagnosing penicillin allergy. In our next video, we will be describing how you can prescribe antibiotics to minimize the likelihood of selecting for an antibiotic-resistant pathogen. Thank you.